Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Youth Service Institute 2022, which is also our 50 by 250 partner summit, as we are officially launching the 50% Youth Participation by America 250 campaign. And we want to start by recognizing our sponsor of both this event and the overall 50 by 250 campaign, uh, Allstate Foundation, as the, uh, as the founding sponsor for 50% Youth Participation by America 250. A little bit about YSA and the, the 50 by 250 campaign, if you're not familiar. Uh, YSA believes that young people, communities, and democracy thrive when we all work together for the common good. So our mission is to make working together for the common good, the common expectation and common experience of every young person in America. And we do that by, uh, by really leading the field through uh, the 50% the Youth Participation by America 250 campaign and really trying to build the capacity and the infrastructure in the field uh, to, to increase youth participation across the board, not just in our programs, but in, uh, in, in local institutions across the country. We continue to run uh, a lot of campaigns, including our National Days of Service of 9-11 Day, MLK Day, and Global Youth Service Day. Uh, as well as service vote around elections and our ongoing ad service campaign. And finally, we support all of those campaigns and all of those partnerships uh, with a, a whole host of programs, including a lot of grants, which, uh, which a lot of you may have received, uh, training and resources in the YSA Knowledge Center, uh, recognition and storytelling, and our weekly youth service briefing newsletter. So the, the, the reason behind the 50% the Youth Participation by America 250 campaign, or 50 by 250 uh, for short, uh, is that uh, as, as we started looking at where we're at as a field and, and where we want to be going in the next several years, uh, and, and we started looking at a lot of different data points, uh, we kept seeing the, the same percentages come up again and again and again uh, of around one in four. Uh, who are who are engaged in different ways. And that means that we're leaving three out of four young people, 75% of young people in the country out of actively participating in, in working together for the common good. And we know that those opportunities are even fewer uh, for young people of color from low income families and communities uh, and, and other groups uh, who aren't usually asked to serve um, really, uh, you know, uh, those who are usually being served and, and not asked to contribute to their community. And we think this is a, a big problem for, you know, the, for uh, achieving the, our vision of thriving young people and thriving communities and a thriving democracy uh, when, uh, when only one in four uh, young people are, are actively participating in, in that. And here are some of the, the, the highlights of the data we pulled out. Uh, you know, we looked at probably Oh, 150 different uh, surveys and reports and white papers and uh, that have been done over the last decade or so. Um, uh, and so, you know, a, a lot of the data is, is all over the place. But, but we noticed this, this trend come through, and you'll see these in these numbers, uh, of mid-20%, maybe 30% uh, uh, across these different forms of participation. Uh, and we're really looking at volunteering and service. Uh, which includes service learning and national service, uh, the, the full spectrum there. Uh, we're looking at voting and civic engagement, uh, uh, and then joining and leadership development opportunities, making sure that young people have the opportunity to be a part of clubs and groups and, and activities where they're working together as a team uh, for, for a common purpose uh, and, and developing uh, and, and practicing those, those, uh, those democracy skills. Uh, and you'll see, uh, you know, that, that again, the, the best data that we have uh, tells us about one in four uh, across the board in, in these different forms of participation. So uh, the, the thing that we really wanted to do as we started launching this campaign is to, uh, is to continue to, to, to take a step back and figure out where we're starting from uh, towards reaching this 50% goal. Uh, and and what the the needs in the field are to make that uh, to make that goal happen and 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 where we're we're seeing uh, opportunities for for growth. So uh, so we'll share several different uh, reports today uh, that collectively uh, will introduce and, and hopefully capture the state of the field. Uh, the first is that we'll share 
a, a summary and top line data of a recent prevalence survey that we did about youth participation in America's K-12 schools. Uh, and then our colleagues from the uh, America Service Commissions will share a recent youth service landscape uh, analysis that they did. Uh, our friends over at the National Youth Leadership Council will share some learnings from the service learning field that came out of the, the National Service Learning Conference this spring. Uh, and then uh, the uh, Iowa Youth Advisory Council and, and Volunteer Iowa will share uh, an example of a youth survey that they did in Iowa uh, to really address barriers to youth participation uh, in, in service and the community and, and some of the opportunities that they see. Uh, and so, you know, collectively, you know, we'll hear from K-12 principals uh, about what this looks like in schools. We'll hear from some of the infrastructure organizations who are thinking about this work at the state level with the, the state service commissions. We'll hear from practitioners in the field uh, via the, the, the learnings uh, from, from the NYLC conference. Uh, and we'll hear from young people themselves, uh, at least from one state uh, in Iowa, but, but we think that will hold true um, for uh, a lot of the findings of that hold true for youth across the country. Uh, and so kind of putting all of these pieces together, we think will give us a pretty good snapshot of, of where we're starting this campaign from and where we wanna go over the next uh, four to five years. So the, um, the, the first thing that I wanna get into is the, uh, the results of the prevalence survey that we did. Uh, and so I will pull that up, uh, and it is available on uh, 50by250.org. Uh, and then if you go under the, the Partner Summit section, uh, you'll see the State of Youth Participation in America page. Uh, and so it will, um, uh, look like this. Uh, and then the, the, this prevalent survey results are all here and there are different slides that you can go through. So, so we'll walk through some of the top line results today uh, in, in introducing this. So a little bit about uh, how this survey was done. Um, uh, we, uh, we started wanting to repeat a prevalent survey that had been done in 1999, 2004, and 2008. Uh, twice of those done by the federal government through, through Learn and Serve America, uh, and then the, the 2004 version done by, uh, by uh, NYLC. And so we really took that same survey and, and repeated it uh, as much of it as possible, and then added in some of the other forms of participation that we're looking at for the 50 by 250 campaign. Uh, and uh, the, the survey went out, uh, the invitation to participate went out to all K-12 principals in the country, uh, and, uh, and these results are based on uh, just over 1,200 uh, responses, um, which is a, a little bit lower than uh, the, uh, the previous surveys, which were about 1,900, but, uh, but, but enough responses to be um, uh, statistically valid. So uh, we'll, 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 we'll share these, uh, these top line numbers. Uh, a more detailed report will be coming later this fall, uh, but, but wanted to share some of the, the top line findings with you. Uh, as, as we launch this campaign. So the, the first uh, slide has uh, the, the overall prevalence rate of the different forms of participation that we asked about. So community service activities, service learning activities, uh, the voting and civic engagement, and the joining and leadership development opportunities. Uh, and as you, you uh, click through, you can see the percentage of schools that, that provide those opportunities. Uh, the percentage of students within those schools that participate in those opportunities, uh, which we then calculate the total um, based on those two numbers of how many students across the, the entire country that we estimate are participating in these types of opportunities. Uh, and then you can see some more details on the percentage of schools that require each of these things or, uh, and arrange those types of opportunities um, as, as part of the, uh, their, their work as a school. So the, the you know, top line findings are pretty consistent with past surveys, uh, seeing some growth uh, in, in overall community service. And you can see uh, the trends uh, on the right-hand side over the, the, the three previous surveys to this one. Uh, and, uh, and so looking at, you know, for example, community service uh, at, at about 78.5% of schools that provide those opportunities, you know, that is a growth from previous uh, surveys, um, but, but within, you know, if you, if you did a trend line here, 
uh, it, it fits right along that trend line um, uh, because note there is a you know a 14 year gap uh, between 2008 and 2022. You know the third and fourth versions of these surveys. Um, you know whereas there were only four or five years between the the previous surveys. So. You know, if if you uh, continued that trend from '99 to '04 to '08 all the way to 2022, you know this is right about in the range that we'd expect to see. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, service learning activities continue to be about uh, half as prevalent as community service activities, and that was true in all of the previous surveys. And we found it again: 36.7% uh, is uh, just about <laughs> exactly half of of that 78.5. Um, and, and so that really held true that, you know, uh, community service is, is incredibly widespread across the country, uh, service learning uh, less so. Uh, and then uh, voting and civic engagement is, is uh, about, you know, not too far behind service learning. Uh, but we'll note later when we get into some details on that, that a lot of this total is actually coming from the basic civic education activities. So basically kind of a civics course. Uh, or, or you know, integrated into social studies or, or wherever in the curriculum, um, versus you know more active civic engagement, uh, you know, kind of doing something with that civic education, uh, and then a lot of uh, um, you know joining and leadership development opportunities. About forty three percent of schools that provide those you know the support for those specific activities and groups uh, that that have a focus on at least partially on leadership skills, uh, and so you'll see. Then in the percentage of students, uh, interestingly, that uh, I want to focus on the community service and service learning, that even though there's a, you know, a big difference in the percentage of schools that provide those opportunities, in the schools that do, the, the participation rate of students are almost the same. So it is definitely not a lack of, uh, of interest on the part of students or teachers in, in providing these programs. Um, and opportunities, uh, you know, we, we see a, a pretty healthy participation rate of, you know, 46.3% in service learning, uh, you know, just a hair behind the 47.2% in community service, um, you know, it's just that so, you know, only half as many schools provide those service learning opportunities to begin with. Uh, and so when you do that, that calculation, you know, 37% uh, of students across the United States are estimated to participate in community service. So a little bit higher than, than the one in four, but still, you know, about one in three. So, so a lot of progress to go. Uh, and then when you look at some of the other forms of participation, you know, service learning at 16.9% of students um, across the country have, you know, participated in those opportunities. So a, a long way to go to reach, uh, you know, our 50% goal and eventually, you know, the, the goal of, uh, of reaching 100% of students um, that have these opportunities. Um, and again, you can you can click through some of the trend lines in different uh, different categories uh, of, of where that data has happened. Um, and so, you know, interestingly, with service learning, you know, there has been an increase, uh, at least uh, after seeing some declines in um, in the previous surveys, uh, which was really at the height of No Child Left Behind. So, you know, we're hoping that some of the flexibility that is that has come in with the the, the updates to uh, the ESEA. Uh, laws have, have hopefully uh, helped provide some of that flexibility for more of that to happen in schools than, than maybe was happening uh, during, during the No Child Left Behind era. Uh, but, but you can click through and, and see you know, uh, those trends over the years. So looking at the next slide, uh, which is diving into the types of civic education and civic engagement activities uh, that we asked about. And in the drop down, you'll see all the different kinds of activities uh, that, um, uh, that, that we asked whether schools provide and, and do the students participate in. And so you'll see, you know, really high numbers on, uh, you know, developing civic knowledge and skills and, you know, kind of basic history and political processes and, and those kinds of things, you know, the things that you'd find in a civics course. Um, as well as uh, discussion of current events. Uh, but when you start getting into, uh, you know, some of the more active engagement uh, opportunities, uh, especially when you get down to, you know, registering to vote uh, or voter education activities or get out the vote uh, for, for those students who are eligible, you see the numbers go way, way down. Uh, and, and I will note, uh, obviously, you'll see the, the, don't know or does not apply section go up uh, for, for a lot of the voting specific ones. And, that be, and that's because uh, obviously the 
our elementary school and middle school uh, survey respondents, um, you know, wouldn't wouldn't have that uh, for for their students since uh, since no one in elementary or middle school is uh, is eligible to vote. Uh, so that's uh, a little bit about the the civic education and engagement. Uh, similarly, looking at leadership uh, development and, and joining opportunities, uh, and you can see the different types of activities that we asked about there. Uh, so extracurricular activities, student government, uh, after school, out of school time programs, uh, uh, student organizations, mentoring programs, uh, you know, community partnerships that are with the schools. Uh, and you'll see as you go through that, um, you know, the, the more traditional extracurricular activities, the academics, the athletics, uh, the arts, uh, you know, those things are fairly popular. And then when you get into, uh, you know, some of the more specific programs uh, that aren't necessarily, you know, typically run by the school, uh, these numbers uh, go down quite a bit. Uh, and so, uh, uh, and so you'll, you'll see that I think there, there's some opportunity there to continue to build school community partnerships to make sure that, uh, you know, if young people aren't engaged in one of the school-based kind of extracurricular activities around academics, arts, or athletics, um, you know, making sure to help connect them to other opportunities, uh, you know, in the community or, or through organizations that might be working in partnership with the school, um, but that, that aren't the, the school themselves providing, providing those opportunities. On the, the next slide, uh, slide four out of the 10, uh, we, we, we look at the reasons for encouraging student participation uh, as reported by the principals. Uh, and you'll see uh, uh, the breakdown for each type, community service, service learning, civic education and engagements, uh, and the, the joining and leadership development, and then the overall average. Uh, and, so, uh, and so there's some interesting differences in here uh, uh, for the, the community service and service learning, uh, the knowledge and understanding of community and altruism are one and two, and they just flip places, uh, and, and developing social emotional learning um, opportunities and, and, and skills is number three for both. Uh, it, it may not surprise you that for the voting and civic engagement, uh, that uh, the civic education <laughs> uh, goal uh, rises to the top. Uh, and, and that's the, also the one where we're connecting to the real world, uh, uh, to real community needs, um, uh, a real world context uh, uh, actually com uh, comes into the top three. And then for joining and leadership, uh, this, is the, this is the only one where 21st century skills uh, actually come into the top three. Uh, social emotional learning, it stays there. Uh, and mental health is actually number three on this, and, and it's the only one where that happens as well. Um, and so, you know, I think what this really tells us is that, you know, the, the, the out-of-school time space, the more informal learning opportunities through those, those, uh, those, um, those groups uh, provide, you know, provide the time to focus on some of these things that they may not be able to during the school day. Uh, so some of the, you know, the, the broader skill development versus specific academic knowledge or skills, uh, you know, and, and that focus on mental health, which we know is so important um, for students, uh, especially the last few years. Uh, and, uh, and, and that, you know, the, the opportunities to build that social capital and connection to community and connection to caring adults for these groups, you know, I think, I think match those, those reasons of, you know, of building those, those 21st century skills and, and focusing on mental health and social emotional learning um, in, in ways that may not happen through some of the other forms of participation. So uh, the uh, next slide gets into the supports that are provided. Uh, and, uh, and similarly, you can go through each different type of participation uh, and then look at the overall average. Uh, the the uh, great thing is that uh, for uh, uh, three out of the four, the importance um, uh, of uh, of student participation is emphasized to all teachers and, and across the school. Uh, and then community partnerships uh, appears in all of this as well. Uh, and then recognition opportunities uh, for, uh, for students or teachers who participate or provide these opportunities uh, really, uh, really rise to the top across the board. So, uh, so we're doing a great job, I think, in, in stressing the importance of it. <laughs> in uh, building some of those partnerships uh, with, with community organizations to make it happen and providing recognition 
uh, but you'll see much lower numbers in terms of you know, financial uh, resources being provided to it in, in the budget uh, and the staffing, which really brings us to the, the next slide, uh, which is the barriers to participation. Uh, and you will see across the board, again, as you click through each form of participation and the results for that, uh, that uh, staffing is the number one barrier uh, across every form of participation, having that dedicated uh, staffing to, to coordinate those activities. Uh, professional development and training for, for the educators is number two for, for uh, uh, all of them, uh, uh, three of them, and, and third for the fourth. And then uh, funding is uh, number three for three, and then is uh, number two on the fourth, so the, the funding and training just flip places. Uh, and then fourth across the board is the lack of time because of other, uh, other requirements. So really consistent and, and all obviously tie together uh, that you know, if, there's, if there's not dedicated staffing, it's probably due because there's not funding for it. And because there's not dedicated staffing, that means that that burden is put on the educators who, have a, who don't have the time because of all the requirements. Uh, and so it's kind of that reinforcing cycle. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and I will note that the lack of transportation for students uh, came as number fifth, uh, almost across the board as well. Uh, and so one of those uh, kind of logistical, uh, you know, kind of lack of, of resource issues uh, there. So, so as we look at how we continue to increase in this in schools, it's really important to keep uh, these, these in mind. Uh, and then the last few slides I won't go through in detail, but you can, uh, but it's uh, exploring uh, the, the breakdowns of each participation type by types of schools. So Title I versus not Title I, elementary, middle school, high school, uh, the school population size, so how many students are in the school, and then the geography of whether they're urban, suburban, exurban, or rural. Uh, and you can go through, uh, you know, each of these uh, and, and see some of the differences uh, between participation types, uh, but, but fairly consistent, uh, uh, you know, more opportunities in high school than in elementary and middle school, uh, typically more opportunities in the really small schools and the, and the really large schools, uh, and maybe not so much in between. Uh, and then, uh, you know, so the, the, uh, some, some pretty big differences between urban, um, urban and rural schools that may have fewer resources versus the, the suburban and exurban schools that, uh, that, that may have, uh, you know, in a lot of communities, um, some, some more resources to provide some of these opportunities. Um, uh, but, uh, but, you know, is, is different for, for each type of participation. Um, I will note one thing that we're trying to dig into a little bit more as, as we continue to analyze these results is something that came out that was surprising was that Title I actually had more opportunities uh, across the board than non-Title I schools, uh, which is the opposite of what the previous surveys have found. Uh, and so we're, 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 we're going to try to dig into that a little bit more to see, uh, to see what's going on there and if that's, you know, if that's true and, and figuring out why that's happening. Um, but uh, it could be a, a really interesting finding. So, um, so with that, uh, I, I will uh, stop sharing and, uh, and, uh, and it's available on, again, on that website, 50by250.org, uh, and you can find uh, that, those full results. Uh, and, and with that, I wanna turn it over to our next presenter, uh, which is uh, from the America Service Commissions. So uh, Rachel, uh, we'll talk about the results of a youth service landscape analysis uh, that they did uh, and, and published uh, late last year uh, that, that really looks at some of the, the infrastructure pieces uh, around uh, why this why youth service happens or doesn't. Uh, so with that, over to you, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Um, 